It's an honor to be here. Uh, it's always an honor to be in Stockholm territory. I, I want to start <clears throat> with uh, telling you a little bit more about who I am and what I do. Uh, probably the best way to describe me is a recovering forester. Uh, I've been recovering for about 40 years uh, <clears throat> after I learned that there was something amiss in my education. Probably the, the most important part of my education has been with elders. Uh, elders, not only Hacklip and Stockliam elders, but I've had the privilege of working uh, in many places in Russia with indigenous people, the uh, Koryak and the Idlmen. Uh, I've worked from <clears throat> Labrador with the Inu to Haida Gwaii uh, with the Haida. Uh, and each one, of those, uh, each one of those experiences has taught me some things. I want to, I, one of the things that I've learned in that process that's really important uh, for people here who are interested in change to think about, and that's that we can't, Western science or indigenous knowledge, neither one of them alone is going to make this work. Uh, the marriage of the two is a really good marriage. Uh, I want to tell you a, a couple of stories about uh, why that's important. I remember uh, being in Labrador uh, with uh, a group of Innu elders, and we were camped in the field uh, teaching young Innu uh, about, yes, I could take that out of here and then I don't have to be constrained, uh, teaching a, a group of young Innu uh, about how forests function. Uh, a good uh, Innu friend of mine, his name is Simone Michel. Uh, Simone uh, doesn't speak much English, and I speak about as much Inu Amun. But I had, in the boreal forest where, where the Inu territories are, uh, there are really critical relationships between soil fungi that you can't see. Uh, mushrooms are the fruiting body of fungi. Uh, those fungi live in decayed wood, uh, and they're responsible for transferring nutrients and water from into plant roots of plants and to maintain the system. It's really critical that there be decayed wood in the soil in order to maintain healthy fungi populations. So I was carrying on with uh, a group of young Inu uh, looking at some decayed wood in the forest floor and explaining to them why it was by no means wasted and showing them, talking about this symbiotic relationship with, between fungi and trees. And when I got done, Simone talked for uh, about an equal length period of time. And when he got done, I asked one of the young Inu what he'd said. And he said, he said the same thing you did. And I learned uh, after that that there is a word in Inu Amun called, that is translated into English called soil hairs, and those soil hairs were the roots of the fungi that I was talking about. So if, if any of you here doubt the strength and the depth of indigenous knowledge, there's something for you to keep, uh, to, to keep in your minds and your heart. Indigenous knowledge has a, a big strength to it that Western science doesn't, and it, see, it sees whole pictures. Uh, it, it, it doesn't seek to take things apart in a reductionist way like the scientific method and to see how they work. It accepts that things work and it makes, draws conclusions from what happens to things when various types of perturbations or impacts uh, affect them. That's rooted in, a, in strong belief systems that guide a really strong land ethic. And I think that that's almost a starting point and an ending point for what we need to know to change. Because without that ethic, it's not going to change. I, I have, um, I, I was, was educated as a scientist. I was taught all about uh, impartiality and objectivity and uh, all of these things that I was sure were right. But after 40 years of working in forests and working in communities with people around the world, I can guarantee you that, that, that objectivity and impartiality are illusions. Uh, 
They, they don't exist. We all see the world through our own set of values, uh, and those values are what draw the conclusions. Uh, it's why timber companies can rationalize doing what you see on those slopes up there. Uh, they have different values, and they can take the same set of information that, uh, that you might hand to me, and I would say, clear-cutting is a bad idea. Uh, but they would say, with the same facts, it's a good idea. That's why objectivity and impartiality are illusions, and they're constructs. They're constructs, particularly in non-indigenous society, to control us. Uh, they're, they're there to, to make you feel intimidated, as, as though you don't uh, think this thing is. How's that? There we go. Uh, so, they're, they're, those ideas are there, or those control mechanisms, mechanisms are there, so that you have to believe the experts. Uh, you have to believe that you have to have to have a PhD to understand how water and forests work. Uh, I almost have one of those things, but that isn't where I learned about how forests and water work. Uh, I learned about it from elders. I learned about it from being in forests. So uh, I'm going to say this at the beginning, and I'll say it at the end. You need to trust your intuition. Uh, we need to connect our hearts to our brains if we're going to solve the problems in front of us. You know, we're the only animal that doesn't seem to want to listen to, to its instinct. Instinct is there for survival. That's why we have in intuition. That's why we have instincts. They're telling us what we need to do to survive. But we live in a culture where the dominant ethic out there is telling us no, 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 don't listen to your instincts or your intuition. Uh, that's not objective or impartial. What we need is objective and impartial scientists. Well, I just explained to you that that's an illusion. And I hope, I hope you remember that. I hope you trust your intuition and connect your hearts to your brains uh, as you go through your lives and seek to, to make this world a better place. Now, to turn a little bit to some of the things that I wanted to talk about, uh, there's a word that Art used uh, that is a common English word called ecosystem. I want to talk to you about what an ecosystem is, but I also want to talk to you about the relationship between ecosystems, cultures, and economies. Because caught up in those three words and that relationship are both why we have the problems we have today and what the solutions can be. Ecosystem is actually a very simple word. Uh, ECO, it, which is the, the, are the first three letters of it, of that word, uh, comes from the Greek word oikos, and that word means home. So if the word ecosystem bothers you or feels unfriendly, Think about it as the home system. The home system provides for our needs. Uh, I want each one of you now to take a big, deep breath. Take a big, deep breath, pull it in, blow it out. That's oxygen. That oxygen is made by green plants. It's particularly made by trees here, particularly in forest landscapes like we live in. If you talk about needs, you can live for about three to 10 minutes, depending upon uh, how fit you are and your lung capacity without oxygen. So I'd say that's a pretty clear need. Three to, three to 10 minutes isn't a very long lifetime without oxygen. Do you know that one of those big ponderosa pine or Douglas fir up there, or the ones behind you here, produce enough oxygen every year that to support two people. So in over an annual cycle of one of these big trees, they provide enough oxygen for two of us to stay alive. And for those of us who are blessed to live in big forests and landscapes like this, those there's a lot of excess oxygen obviously put out by those trees. 
that finds its way around the world and to urban areas and places like that where there isn't enough trees to provide that service. So there's one need or one service that the home system plays. Another big part about ecosystems and needs is water. Water is life. Uh, it connects every part of our bodies. It connects every part of the system. Indeed, it's giving us a, a demonstration right now of how it connects things. But this morning, Brenda talked a lot about salmon. I, I work a lot with salmon as well. And one of the things that I want to say to you is salmon are forest creatures. Uh, they, they depend not just on the, the, the creeks, streams, and rivers, and oceans where they swim, but they depend upon all that forest you can see around us here. The smallest streams in those forests, of which there are billions, uh, when you look at the Fraser River watershed, in those small streams, no salmon swim. But those small streams multiply the water chemistry, the water temperature, the water clarity that salmon need. So just like with a lot of other things with fisheries, we get it backwards when it comes to salmon and forests. Indeed, the most important streams to manage forests around, to make sure we conserve the, the quality of and the vegetation around, are the streams where the salmon and other fish don't swim. Because they're by far the greatest number, and they multiply or accumulate together to make the quality of the salmon habitat and the trout habitat. That's something that has been, is a well-known scientific fact, and when you think about it, it's kind of common sense. But it has been opposed unilaterally by timber companies and mining companies, because if we apply that one understanding of how water works and its relationship to fish, we would dramatically change our relationship with the land when it comes to forestry and mining. If you talk about water as a need, you can live for somewhere between 8 and 14 days without water. Uh, after that, you're toast. So it's not quite as urgent a need as air, but all of us would like to think we were going to make it for a little longer than, an, than another 8 to 14 days. Also, understand that your body is made up of 70% of water or you're not here. Your lymphatic system, which is a, a water-based system that surrounds all of your cells and, and purges toxins from your body, is virtually totally water. So air and water are two really important pieces of ecosystems that are clear needs. Let's talk about a couple of other needs. Obviously food. We just finished lunch. Um, you all have the luxury of being able to close your eyes if you want. Hopefully I won't close mine. But the food you can survive with for about, or without, for about two weeks. Uh, or sorry, about four weeks. So we've gone from We've gone from 3 to 10 minutes for air, 8 to 14 days for water, and about 4 weeks for food. Forests provide and have provided the Stachlium people and indigenous people around the world with their food and medicine for millennia, for thousands of years. All that needed to be done was to maintain healthy, intact forest landscapes and forest stands. And you had deer, you had salmon, you had hoshim. You had medicines. Uh, you had uh, you had various berries uh, and and various fruits that maintained you, maintained you, sustained you, in as part of that ecosystem. The we have uh, with a lot of things that we've done in ecosystems to this point, we have threatened those food supplies, and with the threatening of those food supplies. Uh, we have introduced processed foods uh, laden with salt and sugar, uh, addictive substances that have changed some of the healthiest people in the world 
to challenges with diabetes and many other uh, health forms that aren't part of cultures. They have been created. They've been created by us not recognizing what ecosystems provide for us. So, uh, the, so food and, and the purity of food that comes from ecosystems is a major service. Since, since it's raining like this right now, I, I can't resist the, uh, uh, the analogy that it's too bad that we aren't sitting in a forest. Yeah. Because if we were sitting in a forest, instead of being pelted with large raindrops, it would be kind of like sitting under a leaky umbrella where you occasionally got a drop that filtered its way through the forest uh, grounds and had time for recovery and soaking into the ground. That doesn't happen in clear cuts. Anyway, back, back to ecosystem services. The fourth need uh, it, that comes from ecosystems is shelter. Uh, and we're all seeking that right now uh, for some kind of obvious reasons. Shelter uh, has always come from products that come from the forest. What we have to do is manage that shelter. The forest itself forms a shelter, like I just explained to you, and we can take products from the forest as long as we do it without disturbing the interconnected web that makes up that system at across broad landscapes. So ecosystems are what sustain us. They provide us with our needs. Uh, and it, indeed, they are the most important thing to think about when we plan any kind of human activity there. If you have the right value systems, uh, if you have the right belief systems, you don't need very sophisticated plans because you've been taught the values, you've been taught the ethics to take care of things. That's not true of, of dominant cultures in many parts of the world today, and so there's a need to change that. Now I want to talk a little bit uh, about cultures. Cultures are basically built on values. And values is what you project, what you believe in. Uh, it's based upon belief systems. So the, the two dominant cultures, or sorry, the two dominant ethics in the world today are, can be described as an anthropocentric ethic, which means human-centered. That's, that human-centered ethic is what we see in government, what we see with Enbridge, what we see with timber companies, that the world out there is pretty worthless until we turn it into money. I just finished telling you about needs, but I didn't say a single thing about money because you can't eat money and you can't drink money. Uh, it's not ever going to happen. So money is a false need. And that false need or that construct has been built by corporate and government entities who, again, want to control you. The, the other ethic that, uh, that is paired with that, that's a very powerful ethic, is a kin-centric ethic. That's what indigenous people have had for millennia. A kin-centric ethic, ethic simply means seeing all parts of this ecosystem, including us as people, as relations. That should put some, some meaning to the words that you hear at the end of prayers, all my relations. All my relations in that context isn't talking just about people. It's talking about soil. It's talking about rocks. It's talking about salmon. It's talking about trees. So that kin-centric ethic as opposed to an anthropocentric eth ethic is one that's caring, it's one that's holistic and, and, uh, and transparent, it's inclusive of a wide range of people and values, and it's welcoming. We, if we're going to, to persist as a species and indeed not take other species with us over the next decades, then we need to move from an anthropocentric ethic to a kin-centric ethic. If we don't do that, 
we're, we're literally going to be like the frog that drinks up the pond in which it lives. We've been, we've been brainwashed into a consumer-based economy. The only way you have perpetual growth in an, in an economy is to create artificial needs. I, I look at, I'm a grandfather, and I look at, at I remember when, when I was a kid and growing up, I remember what I had in terms of everything from clothes to what was in my car, you no know, seat belts, things like that. Uh, and then I remember raising two daughters, and I remember seeing the needs change. Uh, and suddenly we were caught in that. And some of them were good needs. But a lot of them, now when I look back at it, probably weren't. Now I have two grandsons who exponentially have increased their needs. And we can't keep doing that. Those artificial needs are get taken out of the soil, they get taken out of the rocks, they get taken out of the trees, and each time we do that, think back to that air, water, food, and shelter. Each time we do that, we borrow, and we're in deep deficit right now in terms of those ecological services. I want to tell you a, a funny story about that, that particular part of creating artificial needs. I remember, um, when my old grandparents were there, uh, and uh, my partner and I, and we were moving them from where they lived back to the West Kootenays where we live, and uh, in the, I had taken a pickup down there with, uh, that had a full box on it and a trailer. It was all full of their stuff. Uh, and they had rented a trailer, and uh, they, which was also full of their stuff, and a car. And I remember my dad sitting there over lunch looking at that, and he, he said to, my, uh, to his granddaughter, my oldest daughter, he said, you know, I can remember when your grandmother and I got married, we didn't have a car, and we could put everything we owned in two suitcases. And he said, I, now, now I remember when your parents got married, they, they did own a car, but they could put everything they owned in a car. And then he said, hmm, look at this. And I, I don't know that Jody thought that was such a funny joke then, but I think he was making a very important point. Okay, so I talked a little bit about ecosystems. I talked a little bit about culture. Now I want to talk a little bit about economies. You know, all an economy is, is people relating to people providing the goods and services they need. People relating to people providing the goods and services they need. With kind of an underscore on the need. That's, those economies have existed since people have existed. They have been trading and bartering, bartering economies. They have been community or at the most regionally based economies. You know, even neoclassical economists, economists that work for the World Bank, etc., will agree that those community-based economies are the only economies that have ever been sustainable in the long term. That's, that's said by the people that will encourage us to uh, have artificial growth. But the history is quite clear there. And you know what else is clear is that the idea of a corporate-based economy growing steadily is an idea that's only been a policy of government since the Second World War. Before that, all virtually all nation states on this planet's goal for economies was full employment. A much, much different goal than what we call the global economy today. You can have community-based economies today. You can opt out of the, the global economy or at least have it have minimal impact on you. Uh, Art described the eco-cultural restoration work that is going on at Hecklip. Uh, that is, a, is building, as he explained, the late Maggie Adolf said, listening to her advice, building slowly a high quality, enduring community-based economy. Just a couple of years ago, uh, one of the accountants for 
or the Hecklip Community Forest Corporation uh, told us that we were the largest forestry employer at that time in Lillooet. Not doing, not cutting down trees, but restoring ecological health and cultural health on the land. So community-based economies are where it's at. They, they are, it's possible for them to recognize both a concentric ethic and putting eco ecosystem health and integrity as a first priority. There's another really fundamental difference when you talk about economies between a corporate economy and a community-based economy. A corporate economy sees you, all of us, employees as costs. So the more we can eliminate all of us from that system, the more they can make profits, which is what they're there to do for their shareholders. They're not there to take care of the land. They're not there to restore the tar sands. They're not there to do the things that they tell you on TV. They're legally required. That's their mandate, to be legally required to maximize profits. So they see any of us, uh, whether we're employees or activists or people that are in their way, as costs. In a community economy, people are benefits. People aren't costs. The profits in a community-based economy aren't money. They're happy, healthy people doing meaningful work. So if we start putting these pieces together here a little bit, let's remember that we need ecosystems, healthy ecosystems at all scales, from the scales of those tiny creeks I spoke to you about to the whole Fraser River watershed, we need to have people adopt a shared concentric ethic. Doesn't have to be all stamped out of the same system or with exactly the same words because there's latitude there. But we need to have a shared ethic that's concentric, that sees us as part of the system, not something to dominate it. Uh, it's, it we need to see all our relations, and we need to feel that both in our hearts and our minds. And we need to then relate to each other in that system through community-based economies. If we do that, then we can start making the kinds of shifts that are necessary. Before I talk about a couple of other things, I want to reflect on where to put your time and where to put your priorities. We heard a couple of wonderful talks today with two, from two very dedicated legal counsel. I think legal cases and lawsuits are a part, piece of the puzzle, that's for sure. But I'm going to reflect as a non-lawyer on the fact that I've worked with indigenous people for almost 40 years and communities. I've been an expert witness many times in court. I've read hundreds of court decisions that had good judgments uh, and then got ignored by government. Uh, and they continue to be ignored by government. If government did what those court decisions said, we would have a different world. But there, it, it, when you get to that point, you get stymied. I still think they're an important thing to do because they use the system that is to try to make change. But you know what I think would be a powerful thing is that if all of you went back to your communities and didn't ask permission to implement a concentric ethic, didn't ask permission to manage your land uh, in ways that was concentric and protected ecosystems and restored them, but you just do it, period. For all of you who are here who are indigenous people, you have that right more clearly than any of the rest of us newcomers. You, you, that, it is your land. There, I mean, no matter how you want to look at the evidence, uh, it, it's your land. So you can do that. And, and until we have that happen in enough places, then a lot of the hard legal work, a lot of the hard activist work, etc., will not be felt as well. That, that kind of, of local doing it is what will bring the critical mass that will lead to constructive change. So 
what what's the state of things right now? Let's let's ask the question: Where are we? I talked about the relationship between ecosystems, cultures, and economies. Now let's ask the question: What where are we today? What's going on? Well, the the things that you heard a lot of other speakers talk about is an anthropocentric ethic drives what happens in politics. It drives what happens in in resource extraction and in in consumer-based economies. So what do we get out of that? We get clear cuts. Uh, we get salmon farms. We get tar sands. Uh, and we get it in by and large urban sprawl with people who don't even think about an ecosystem but think more about what's paved and what isn't paved and where the manicured gardens go. I'm actually working with a friend of mine in Vancouver right now to adopt our planning system to start restoring ecosystem health in parts of Vancouver. Uh, it's applying a, an ethic uh, and a system to an urban area to bring back some of those recognition of needs and ecological services. But that anthropocentric ethic, coupled with the way we have abused land and resources, has not only stressed ecosystems, it stressed us. Uh, when we look at everything from rates of cancer to hypertension to uh, all of those things that we find it more prevalent in our societies today, uh, it's not just diet, it's what we're doing to this, this earth. What you do to earth, you do to yourselves, and you can't escape that. Uh, all you have to do is go back and think about that oxygen, the water, the food, all of that brings that back to you. So if, if we live if we're stressed and Earth is stressed, what's some of the evidence of that? Species loss. We lose 30,000 species a year. 30,000 species a year that we know of. We, there are, we have documented that there's about, actually documented, two and a half million species on this planet. But every biologist who studied it will tell us that there's at least between 10 and 40 million species here. So if we're losing 30,000 species a year, it may be more like 100 or 200,000 species a year. We don't even know what we're losing. And when we start to lose critical species that are keystone species in the system, then the system starts falling apart. Let me tell you about uh, a couple of those keystone species. I mentioned to you soil fungi. Well, you know, you may think the roots of plants, these trees or grass or whatever you're looking at uh, in terms of a plant, you may think that those roots are what's responsible for picking up the water and nutrients in your garden or, or in, here in natural systems, but it's really soil fungi in most cases that wrap around the roots of those those plants have access to the water and nutrients because their roots are so fine that you can put four kilometers of them in a gram of forest soil that you can hold in the palm of your hand. So you can't find tree roots that are that fine. So they connect the soil, water, and nutrients to the rest of the ecosystem and make the system work. Because without green plants and the process of photosynthesis, where carbon dioxide and water and sunlight are made into carbohydrates and sugars and oxygen. Without that, there's no life as we know it, period. Full stop. It doesn't work. And that, those soil fungi are there to keep that system working. They're a keystone species. One, and I wonder how many of you have ever seen a mining plan or a forestry plan or an agriculture plan that was built around the soil fungi. Ever, anyone ever see one of those that recognized what, what they were about? I read lots of plans and I've never seen one. So the other thing to know is that those soil fungi in a forest landscape like around us 
in order for them to be healthy, they need dead trees. They need trees that are decomposed, that they can use as a substrate to get moisture out of, and tap into roots of living plants where they can get nutrients and water uh, and the, the products of photosynthesis to maintain their lives. So if you practice conventional forestry and you cut down the trees, remove them, plant a few new ones, cut down the trees and remove them, suddenly you have no decayed wood in the, in the forest soil. You not only have impoverished forests, but I could take you to some places in Northern Ontario where former forests in the boreal ecosystem are now shrub fields. They're shrub fields because those mycorrhizal fungi, which means fungus root connection, that symbiosis is gone because the soil fungi are gone. Let's talk about another keystone part of, of the ecosystems we live in, old growth forests. Old growth forests are the elders of these landscapes. They're the ones that have the highest level of diversity than any other part of the landscape. Uh, those old growth forests have the greatest number of species. They produce the highest quality water. They meter that water out through the years and uh, over a, an annual season to make sure that all parts of the system have adequate water resources. We, lots of you know about the mountain pine beetle epidemic in British Columbia. That was caused by us. That was caused by clear cutting, oversimplifying landscapes, global warming to warm up winters that prevents uh, the, the climate from regulating the populations of mountain pine beetles, and removal of old growth forests. Because in old growth forest ecosystems, uh, there live carnivorous beetles that eat herbivorous beetles like the mountain pine beetle. So if you have old growth forests scattered throughout your landscape, uh, then and you're a mountain pine beetle that successfully colonized or uh, has successfully colonized a couple of trees, and you're flying off to look for your next victim, you're liable to become a victim yourself. Uh, you're likely to become lunch or dinner for some carnivorous beetle in an old growth forest. But by simplifying the landscape the way we have, we no longer have that check and balance. And so we've lost water, we've lost pest control, if you want to think about that, and most of all, we've lost genetic diversity because those old forests had the broadest gene pools. And as we start to think about the climate warming and becoming more stressed, that broad gene pool is really important because the broader the gene pool is, the more chance we have of those forest organisms, whether they're plants or animals in those old growth forests, breeding individuals that are capable of existing in hotter, drier kinds of conditions. Tree plantations won't do it. Young forests won't do it. It's, that, it's just like the knowledge of the elders, that's the benefits, that's the, the gift of those old growth forests in the landscape. So, uh, there's another big problem. The, the relationships that are associated or lack of the loss of those relationships with species loss. We also have a process underway called global warming. Uh, and let me just, there's a lot to say about global warming, but I'm just going to kind of boil down a couple of important things for you. First of all, we have lived in a, 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 what's called the Holocene epic geologically. We've had relatively mild climates. Uh, even, even in Canada, we have relatively mild climates compared to what it was before. And during that relatively re relative period of moderate climates, there's been about 280 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 280 parts. That carbon dioxide traps uh, certain wavelengths uh, that come from the sun uh, and bounce them back to the Earth, which is part of the Gaia and Earth's process of life and warm, keeping the planet warm. But when we started burning fossil fuels uh, in the, with the Industrial Revolution, 
we started increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Climate change scientists tell us that when we reach 350 to 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we pass irreversible tipping points that we can't stop. Right now we have 390 parts per million in the atmosphere and we're gaining about five to eight parts per million every year. So we're halfway between the two the points that climate change scientists tell us that we're, we will reach irreversible tipping points. What do they mean by irreversible tipping points? Well, there's a number of things. Somewhere in that range of concentration of CO2, the temperature where we are right now will probably average about two degrees Celsius higher than it is today. Doesn't sound like much, but when you start, when you start thinking about how plants are or have organized themselves to flower at certain times, uh, and insects are geared to pollinate them at certain times, you throw off all kinds of natural cycles, natural rhythms that way. But when, if we're going to see it two degrees hotter at the poles, at the South Pole and the North Pole, the Arctic and the Antarctic, is going to see it more like four to five degrees hotter. That's why things are happening faster there. And one of the irreversible processes that may already be underway is the melting of permafrost. Uh, and that it, it's recorded in both the Arctic and Antarctic. And when permafrost melts, it has, is associated with a lot of organic soils. And as they change from being frozen to being thawed, they release methane gas, which is 20 to 40 times more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. So that's the kind of ir irreversible tipping points we're talking about when we talk about global warming. You know, global warming is a daunting thing. It's one of these things that it infuriates me that it's not on the news every night. In fact, it's less on the news now than it was a decade ago. We have a prime minister in this country who has his fingers in his ears and his hands over his eyes when it comes to even recognizing that it, it, that it exists. I don't know how you could have kids, let alone grandkids, and not be concerned about that. Not be concerned about taking precautionary actions now, not in the future. But that's where we get back to the problem of the anthropocentric eth ethic and the corporate-based economy. That's what fuels people like our prime minister. So uh, the climate change is the, the, the best way to deal with climate change is to restore natural ecosystem integrity, to put the parts back, to reintroduce indigenous management systems. That's what we're trying to do at Hecklip and what we're trying to do in some other places as well. We're trying to say, how do we help nature have the parts that she will need going into this global warming period to survive as best as possible? The most, what, the, the biggest part of that is to keep it diverse. We, we, want to, we, we don't want to narrow our options, we want to broaden our options. We want to have as diverse a forest at, at the site level and at this large landscape level. So we don't want to do just one thing, we want to do a lot of different things. And we want to fit into natural processes. We want to be part of those processes, not trying to impose our will upon them. That, that's something you can do in your backyards. That's something you can do in your watershed. That's something you can do in the watersheds that make up your region. That's why I said what I did at the beginning, that it's time for all of you, all of us, to take back that control, to not ask please and thank you, but to do it. Uh, and that, that will not only teach us things about relating to each other, but it will also teach us a lot about ecosystems and how they work. So I'm going to just conclude this with a little bit more definition 
of what I've been talking about in terms of what it looks like. First of all, you know, I've really been talking about consciousness. Having consciousness in an understandable way about what's going on around us. Probably all of us here share a pretty similar range of consciousness about these issues. A pretty similar awareness. We may not have, each one of us is going to have more details about some of the issues than others, but uh, collectively as a group we probably have a, a lot of consciousness about the problems that Earth uh, faces today and therefore the problems our species faces. But you know, the majority of the people out there don't. And so an important thing for all of you is not just to talk to each other, not just to, to stay in the comfortable bounds of people who share your consciousness, but shed those off a little bit. Uh, take a risk. Go talk to people who don't share that consciousness and help them to make that transition. We need to do that. Uh, we, we have to learn how to have a bigger set of population that, that understands and has this consciousness and awareness. That's a starting, a, an important starting point for change. The other thing that I can urge you to do when you talk to people about that consciousness is start with the fact that any human activities need to recognize a really simple hierarchy. I've already talked about it, but let me just kind of summarize it for you. Economies are part of human cultures, and human cultures are part of ecosystems. So if you take care of ecosystems, nurture them, restore them, help natural processes to restore them, then you'll always have a healthy culture. And if you have a healthy culture, you'll always have healthy economies, because economies are just people relating to people providing the goods and services that we need, with an emphasis on that need. So when you're trying to move people's consciousness, talk about that hierarchy. Uh, because you don't have to, you just have to open up the pages of most newspapers and magazines today to have, to see where industry or government is saying, well, we have to balance the environment and the economy. Uh, I mean, our Prime Minister says that. He says that about the laws that uh, he's changed that, uh, that Brenda was talking about earlier today. So you need to correct him and say, no, no, you, that let's, let's rethink this. Let's, let's get this hierarchy in the right, right order. Because without healthy, intact ecosystems, there is no sustainability, there is no system. And I have a songwriter, a Métis friend, who wrote this song about that called Maybe the Humans Have to Go. Uh, because we're maybe, we're not only the responsible ones for that, but we may be the only spare species on this planet. So, what, in terms of putting that hierarchy into practice, we use a process or carry out a, a, a process that we call ecosystem-based conservation planning. I used to just call it ecosystem-based planning, uh, and I was quite used over 30 years to having my peers telling me I was crazy, uh, and that it, it, that, uh, that ecosystem-based planning didn't make any sense. But now everybody does ecosystem-based planning, so I've added another word to it to try to differentiate what we do from what the mainstream ecosystem-based management is. Let me tell you the key ingredients of it. It starts with precautionary decision-making. Sound familiar? I've heard several people talk about it. Well, we put it into practice. Uh, we make cautious decisions. We can always decide to cut a tree later, but you only get to decide to cut a tree once. And so we're going to make cautious decisions. Another thing is we start with large landscapes. The larger the landscape, the better. Uh, for Hecklip Survival Territory, which is about 35,000 hectares, sounds like a, a big area, and it is to a human being. It is a big area. But in that lens, that's a small landscape. And we need to understand how those pieces, all those clusters of interdependent, interconnected ecosystems work because we don't want to start down here at this little patch level 
if we start at the patch level, we may do something that's wrong for the bigger picture. So you've got to start with as big a picture as possible. In Labrador, we did an ecosystem-based conservation plan a number of years ago for the Inu. It covered 7.1 million hectares. It's a good example of uh, what can happen because as part of our planning, the first thing we say is focus on what to protect, then on what to use. So we design networks of ecological reserves and cultural reserves where industrial applications or any kind of, of serious removal of resources does not include, does not occur. That happens from that big landscape level right down to the individual patch so that we maintain natural parts, whether you're talking about ridges on mountains like that or fallen trees on the forest floor in a patch. So may, focusing on what to protect, then on what to use. Well, let me just finish the Inu story. 7.1 million hectares. We did the plan and said half of that, 50% of it, needs to be protected in large reserves, uh, in, in cultural and ecological reserves. And then in the rest of that area, about another 50% of that needs to be protected in finer scale networks of protection. The Newfoundland and Labrador government laughed at us. Uh, they laughed at the Inu. They said, you guys are crazy. So we said, okay, well, let's see how crazy we are. Let's, we'll have this peer reviewed. So we had it peer reviewed by economists, ecologists, uh, and uh, a variety of other scientists. They, the, and we even asked the Newfoundland government to contribute to it. Well, at the end, all of the scientists, including the economists, because we were building a community-based economy there, said, you're doing exactly the right thing. This is leading edge ecology, leading, a, leading edge economics. It's where we need to go. It's the only time in 40 years I've ever seen a government in a, at a negotiating table apologize to a First Nation. And it was a marvelous moment. I'm sure the many Innu elders and people that have worked hard to dedicate their lives and their knowledge to that plan felt good. They felt, uh, they, they felt vindicated by that. So, Ecosystem-based conservation planning, precautionary decisions, multiple spatial scale design of protecting ecosystems from large landscapes down to individual patches, and community-based economies where we see jobs as profits, uh, not dollars. So let me conclude with just a couple of, of uh, more philosophical kinds of, of thoughts. The, I began by saying you need to connect your heart to your brain. I want to end there too. We can't, we can't solve these problems with just the left side of our, our head. We have to connect our hearts to our brains. We need to appreciate each other. We need to, to realize that there's far less that keeps us apart uh, or brings us, keeps us apart than there is that brings us together. We're all different, and that's good. We want that kind of diversity. But we, we need to learn how to be appreciative. And you know, we're not taught that in school. By and large, we're not taught that at home. Because appreciation, at the root of it, it's love. And love is what is going to connect us and lead us in the right direction to do what we need to do.